Hello, I'm Anna De La Vega and welcome to the third episode of Flute Reboot on Idagio Live, the place where classical music happens. Um, you can tune in at the moment every evening for chats and masterclasses from your favourite classical musicians from around the world. Um, this episode is called Bach's Brandenburg Bombshell which they totally are. The Brandenburgs are, of course, a quintessentially important part of musical history. And today we look at some myths and facts about this random and groundbreaking set of six concertos. We all know of them, but how much do we really know? In regards to the flute, the Brandenburgs gave the flute its ultimate stamp of approval and really launched it into the Baroque period as an important instrument. It appears in half the concertos, number two, four, and five. And the fifth Brandenburg concerto is the very first requested appearance for the Traverso flute as a solo concerto instrument. So carrying on from last week, we saw the enormous changes over at Versailles. We saw that from 1550 to 1650, the great violin making tradition of Northern Italy that still fascinates us today, Stradivari, Guarneri, exploded and the violin became enormously popular, going from a peasant dance instrument down at the pub to a performance instrument at court. And so the popularity of the, the simple, quite limited Renaissance flutes took an absolute nosedive and a revelation in flute making happened. The instrument broke into three, making it better tuned. An additional key was added, um, added making it chromatic. And the man allegedly responsible for this revolution was Jacques Hotter at the court of Louis XIV in around 1680. Now, Hotete's colleague at Versailles, Lully, was responsible for a string group called the 24 Violons du Roi, the 24 Violins of the King. Lully acknowledges Hotete's new and improved one key traverso flute and welcomes him into the orchestra for the very first time. Now, I want to today hover on Lully's orchestra and share a few details because this is so important to the history of classical music. The, the 24 violins is the origin of the modern orchestra. Now, some funny facts. Um, in this orchestra, like the modern orchestra, you have five groups of strings pitched differently from high to low. So in the modern day, we have first violin, second violins, viola, cello, bass. In this founding orchestra, there was violin, alto viola, tenor viola, lower tenor viola and cello. Go the violas, that's like three fifths of the orchestra. Now to be a member of the 24 violon, you had to jump through the following hoops. Have an impeccable reputation, whatever that means, and be a Roman Catholic. Privileges included tax exemption, awesome, and the right to carry a rapier. Now, I'm going to show you what a rapier is, as it's very interesting that this was the chosen uniform for entering an orchestra. There we go. Can you imagine performing with that thing dangling off your belt? <laughs> so the most fascinating aspect for me is as follows. So we have a string orchestra sorted, but how does this move towards the orchestra as we know it today with winds and brass? The wind instruments at Versailles were actually the guys down at the Grande Ecurie at the Royal Stables. The strings were up at the court playing at dinners and banquets and the winds were down at the stables because those guys were engaged in hunting and war and celebratory open, celebratory open air occasions. So you can imagine uh, yeah, it, do, it doesn't go so well playing a violin riding a horse, but, but horns is a different story. So one imagines Lully saying to Louis XIV, I have a few ideas, can I bring some of the wind playing guys up from the stables to join my 24 violins? And this really is the birth of the modern orchestra, which I find fascinating. Now, Hotter, our flautist, who brought much of this about, he is a very important figure, not only because he developed the flute mechanically, 
um, and that he was the first player in the orchestra, but because he really was perhaps the first professional flautist ever and very skilled. When you have, of course, a virtuoso on any instrument, it changes the life and the popularity of that instrument. In the modern day, if, if you think of Lang Lang, there's 20 million pianists in China, um, inspired by this superstar pianist from their country. So, but furthermore with Hotete, he composed a lot for the flute. And when a real master composes for his instrument, he knows its capabilities, he can push its limits and thus impress audiences and attract interest. One obviously thinks of, of Paganini in the case of the violin. But um, perhaps the most important thing about Hotete was that he wrote a book called L'Art de Prélude sur la Flûte Traversière, which was published in 1719. It was Europe's first flute manual, so a book on how to play the instrument. And still today, it gives us not only an insight on how to play the instrument, but also tells us about performance practices at the time in regards to style, trills, ornamentation, um, dance tempi with um, bure or polonaise, also um, like the movements of sonatas. So it's really, really important. Um, now, as we have seen in many other points in history, uh, the Frenchies are running the show on top of things, as was the case with the flute there in Vers Versailles. And then enter the Germans. In the very same year, Hotete publishes his book. In Kötten, in Germany, Johann Sebastian Bach is writing his groundbreaking Brandenburg concertos, a set of six concertos, each one with bizarre and never seen before or since instrumentation. So I'm going to show you exactly the instrumentation that we are talking about. I always wonder if you're reading my emails when I share you my screen. Okay. So, here are the solo instruments of the Brandenburg Concertos. Concerto one, violin, three oboes, bassoon, and two horns as solo instruments, not orchestra, soloists. Concerto two, violin, oboe, piccolo trumpet, flute. Concerto three, three violins, three violas, three celli as soloists. Concerto four, a violin and two flutes. Concerto five, violin, flute, harpsichord, and Concerto six, even more random, two violas, two viola da gamba, and one cello. So that is the instrumentation of the Brandenburgs. Um, so, you know, there is so much mystery around these concertos and a lot of it is actually not resolved, but there are a few talk points. One of the standout aspects of the Brandenburg concertos is the use of the harpsichord. Until the Brandenburgs, the harpsichord, which is now the piano um, developed into being the piano as we know it today was basically a continual instrument for accompaniment and bass line. In the Brandenburgs it takes on a whole new role. In the fifth concerto it has an enormous cadenza entirely written out by the composer which is very extraordinary. It's extremely technically challenging and just simply rock and roll awesome <laughs> please listen if, if you don't if you you don't know it in the third concerto the second movement there is only two chords in the strings the whole way through and some squiggly lines um, by the composer giving the license to improvise now who's going to do that there are nine solo string players and one harpsichordist and while it has confused performers for centuries many think it just must have again meant that the harpsichord should embellish so why um, this sudden boom? Because basically in the Brandenburgs, um, particularly in the fifth concerto, the harpsichord goes from zero to, to hero. <laughs> um, when Bach started writing the Brandenburgs, he was working for the court of Kirten and they had just bought a new double manual harpsichord. And now I am going to show you what that looks like. Here we go. So here is the original harpsichord, single manual, 
And here is the two, see the two keyboards. It's like Fiat Panda to Ferrari, okay? And this was, this was absolutely um, revolutionary because the new instrument was, was more versatile, it had more notes, you could shift registers and dynamics much more easily. On the earlier harpsichord with one manual, you had to pull um, a register stop um, and leave the keys uh, for half a bar to change registers. So the original score of Brandenburg 5 extends beyond what the earlier keyboard can take. So it must have been an influence. So when he began working on the Brandenburgs, he was at the court of Kirtan, possibly excited to explore the new double manual harpsichord. But when he actually finished the concertos two years later, he was using them um, as a job application for the Margraf of Brandenburg. Now the Margraf was a bit of a second tier aristocrat, the younger brother of King Frederick I of Prussia. Um, Bach presents him with this beautifully bounded group of six concertos, which was to change the course of history and 300 years later today still be a measuring post. And he didn't get the job. Old Margraf of Brandenburg was like, mm, not so much. So <laughs> another example um, of something valuable being shunned at the beginning. I think of Harry Potter, The Godfather, um, Star Wars, no publisher or film studio was, was in the slightest bit interested in the beginning. And the same with, with the Brandenburgs in a way. And I mean, I, I always quite like these stories. I think they're actually the ultimate stories of, of hope in a way. It's like no matter where one gets knocked back in life, maybe it's a it's a Harry Potter or, or a Brandenburg that you're peddling around, but people just don't understand it yet. Um, now there could be a simple reason for the knockback. Margaf Brandenburg is a younger brother. Younger brothers generally have smaller castles and less cash. So the Margot for Brandenburg simply couldn't cope with the instrumentation Bach had written for, which was an enormously diverse number of virtuoso players. Remember that, um, that public performance did not exist yet, only in church. So the performances of secular music needed to be managed by the musicians that, that you employed um, under your roof. The concertos uh, uh, are also demanding. These are for true virtuosos. Um, there, there are two horns in the first concerto. Horns were new to the orchestra in 1721 and not available everywhere. It's like old Margaf possibly didn't have two horns among his kitchen staff. Um, so you're probably asking why did Bach all of a sudden write these enormous concertos with all this wild instrumentation and, and give them to a person who couldn't, um, couldn't perform them? Strange, there can be can, uh, some reasons. Strange instrumentation often indicates the music was meant for a particular set of musicians. If a part is very complicated. It has throughout the ages also usually implied um, it was meant for a particular virtuoso known to the composer. So in Brandenburg 4, you need a, a killer violinist. Bach must have known someone who could manage it. Um, so we must remember that when he started writing these concertos, he was at the court, court of Kirtan, and perhaps the Kirtans had a better lineup of musicians. Um, but documentation is very rare. We don't, we don't really exactly know. But there is another really interesting um, possible idea. For much of Bach's life, he was employed by the church to write sacred music. Kirtan was one of the few times in his career and possibly, and actually, yes, the first time in his career where he was composing secular music. Um, and so perhaps he was just breaking free of the chains of being a composer for the church and, and really let a little loose with his instrumentation and, and creativity. And I mean, actually we think of Bach as, 
as so orderly. Um, but this actually happened at other times in his life. So Matthew's Passion has two orchestras and two choirs. It was revolutionary and, and very difficult to manage at that time. The B minor mass just wasn't performed. It was far too big um, to perform within Lutheran mass possibilities. And I, pers I, I love this because it invites us to think of Bach in, in the romantic idea of, of the composer, of a composer, breaking boundaries, you know, Beethoven destroying pianos because the instruments couldn't cope with his ideas and his explosive emotion. I love this, this glimpse into Bach in this way, a man of passion and dreams, um, because we tend to consider him uh, often as, as something else. So back to the flute. It is, it is included in half of these concertos, of these Brandenburg concertos, number two, four, and five. In Brandenburg five, the new transverse flute is specifically requested. And here it is the most soloistic together with um, the violin and the harpsichord. Bach clearly was pleased with the flute in the Brandenburgs because soon after he wrote the partita in A minor, of his four orchestral suites, one is with the flute as the central figure. So Matthew's Passion has numerous solos for the flute. At one point, the two orchestras basically stop playing and the flute is almost alone. He wrote a number of incredible sonatas, which are the bread and butter of our repertoire. Some say he, he had a real love affair with the instrument. And this is so important for the history of the flute because Firstly, since then, we every flute recital can include music from the great master. But in, in his time, his interest inspired other composers to then write for the, for the flute, Telemann, Vivaldi and Handel in particular soon after. And there's, so there's, there's no other period in history where the flute enjoyed such popularity as in the Baroque period until 20th century French music. And a lot of the significant works come from the years directly after Bach wrote the Brandenburgs. And um, so to finish up with repertoire for an instrument often breeds instrumentalists. A couple of years after the Brandenburgs were published, a young go-getter flautist by the name of Joachim Quanz embarked on a tour of Europe. And he visited Scalati in Naples and Blavet in Paris and Handel in London before arriving in Berlin, where he met a prince called Frederick. Quantz was asked to give flute lessons to the young prince and a really important relationship was born. That prince became king, moved to Sanssouci in Potsdam, taking Quantz with him. And Sanssouci became almost a worship ground of the flute for the next 40 years, riding off the passion of the king. No other royal throughout history, it has been said, has ever dedicated themselves to an instrument as Frederick II of Prussia did to the flute. So thank you very much. Join me next week for episode four, Quants and the King. Uh, you're listening to Adagio Live and I'm Anna Della Vega and see you soon. Take care. Bye.